What do you do with a liar? Don't trust him any further than you can check him. Here's a lie. We have the Septuagint. <laughs> no, we don't. I will actually go over this in another vlog, but for now, just know that what they call the Septuagint is supposed to be a Greek Old Testament mixed with Apocrypha that was supposedly created by 72 translators in Alexandria, Egypt, starting in 285 BC. Then the story goes that Jesus and the apostles quoted from that Septuagint Old Testament and not the Hebrew. Here's the problem. We don't have any copies anywhere of more than just a few Greek Old Testament words. Y you couldn't make a Septuagint out of them. See this book right here? This is my copy that I got at Fuller Seminary of the Septuagint with Apocrypha. It's from 1851. It isn't the Bible they say Jesus used. This is the Codex Vaticanus blended with the Codex Alexandrinus. No one dates either of those at less than 350 to 450 years after Jesus. My professor said, your Septuagint isn't the best one. You need the critical text. All right. See this book? I just got it. It's the critical text, the Ralph's Hanhart Septuaginta from 2006. It's been slightly updated from the 1935 edition. Jesus didn't use this book either. It's actually a blending of the codices Alexandrinus and Vaticanus along with the Sinaiticus. Again, those are all from at least three centuries after Jesus, not before. It's also partly based upon readings from something called the Hexapla. And that takes us to a liar named Origen. One guy may actually be the origin of the messed up so-called Septuagint in the form we find it today, as we see it in the Alexandrinus, the Vaticanus, and the Sinaiticus. And that origin is the liar Origen. Be very careful when you study Origen. Don't believe anything you can't prove. Origen is the father of modern doubting Bibles. He lived almost 70 years, from about 184 to 254 AD. Most of his life was in Alexandria, Egypt, and the last 24 years in Caesarea Maritima, 70 miles northwest of Jerusalem. That's where he put together the Hexapla. More on that later. According to Constantine's lapdog Eusebius, in 203 AD, as a young man of 18 or 19, Origen restarted the catechetical school of Alexandria. It was a school of exegesis and theology, kind of like a seminary. Origen became extremely popular. I have said that I suspected the only way Origen could write the books they said he did is if he had stenographers with him practically 24-7 like the Mormons Joseph Smith and later Brigham Young did. Well, I found out he did. A wealthy convert named Ambrose gave Origen at least seven stenographers, seven longhand scribes to prepare the books, and ladies to make copies of those books. So he could just talk away and they'd write it down and publish it. That's how he wrote over 2,000 books. So Origen was popular. But Origen was elitist as well. Origen believed there are some things, or many things, that only higher level scholars or initiates into his private religion should know. We know this from his own writings and from people who claimed to follow his teachings. Madame Blavatsky, who founded the occultic religion Theosophy, in her book, Isis Unveiled, said this, Origen, who belonged to the Alexandrian school of Platonists, declares that Moses, besides the teachings of the covenant, communicated some very important secrets from the hidden depths of the law to the 70 elders. 
These he enjoined them to impart only to persons they found worthy. She also wrote that Origen and Clement of Alexandria before him were well versed in pagan symbology, having begun their careers as philosophers. I found out that when Origen saw a student who showed promise, he'd also teach him geometry and philosophy. Walter Walsh, in The Secret History of the Oxford Movement, about 1897, revealed that in the Church of Alexandria, the catechumens, the students, were not taught all the doctrines of the Christian faith. Many of these were treated by their teachers as secret doctrines to be held in reserve. This doctrine of reserve from Clement of Alexandria before him and Origen taught that it was okay to lie to their students if they weren't worthy or ready for the deeper secrets of God. So people felt that Origen, or people that Origen felt weren't worthy, could be left in the dark or allowed to believe lies because only the scholars or spiritually advanced could learn the esoteric secret doctrines. That is the same doctrine of reserve that was used in England. Hundreds of secretly ordained Catholic priests pretended to be Protestants in the 1800s. Right here, page 161, November 22nd, 1894. This is from the Catholics. says, we have just, we have heard that, we have heard just lately that there are now 800 clergymen of the Church of England who have been validly ordained by Dr. Lee and his co-bishops to the order of corporate reunion. In other words, they were secretly reordained Catholics while still looking like Protestants. And this has been a big doctrine of the Jesuit order from its founding in the 1540s to the present day. But wait, didn't Origen also give us that text scholarly hexapla, the six-columned Old Testament in Hebrew, three different Greek versions, and the Septuagint? One of my friends said to me, he sounds like a person who'd preserve the text, not change it. You're right, he does sound like that. But Origen's doctrine of reserve means that he could admit what he truly believed or truly researched to a few elite people and lie to the rest because he thought they were unworthy. Watch how this plays out. Origen made a big book, as I said before, with six complete Old Testaments. It was so huge, thousands of pages, that only one was ever made, and it took him over 20 years to make it. So here's what it sort of looked like. To fit all six columns, only one or two words could be on each line. Column one was Hebrew, written with Hebrew letters. Column, column one here. Column two was the same Hebrew, written with Greek letters. Column three was a translation of the Hebrew into Greek by Aquila, a convert to Judaism. Jewish scholars say it was literal, but so literal it didn't always make sense in Greek. That was done about 120 to 130 A.D. Column four was a totally different Greek translation of the Hebrew by Symmachus. He did it about 170 to 200 A.D. Column six was a very free translation by Theodotion. Jewish scholars say he didn't really know Hebrew and probably went from Greek to Greek. He wrote about the same time as Symmachus. And that brings us to column five. That was done by Origen. And all the texts I can find say it was marked with an O for Origen, not marked with LXX for the Septuagint. Origen spent a couple of decades working, working on this huge set of books. He marked what was the commonly used Greek text in Alexandria with two signs called the asterisk or metabolus and obelisk or obelus. He used the asterisk to add into his fifth column where the Hebrew had words, but they weren't in the Greek. When that happened, he usually copied the Hebrew from Theodotion. 
He used the obelisk to mark in his fifth column where the Greek had words, but they weren't in the Hebrew. During this big project, he wrote commentaries on books of the Bible. He also wrote lessons or homilies. In them, he clearly said, if it's not in the Hebrew, the Alexandrian Greek is wrong. But Origen was not afraid to lie when it was convenient. So far, Origen's textual theory looks pretty good. His fifth column added in words that were missing from the Greek, and he marked as spurious or fake the words that were in the Alexandrian Greek, but not in the Hebrew. But... Back in Alexandria, some people accused Origen of fawning on the Jews and putting down the Alexandrian Bible. That got him in trouble. Because the proto-Catholic churches there thought he was abandoning the Old Testament mixed with Apocrypha that they used. The Hebrew didn't have the Apocrypha, and if they went by the Hebrew, they'd have to abandon the Apocrypha and all sorts of other errors in their Alexandrian Bible. They accused Origen of being a traitor to their religion. They were basically right, but Origen couldn't tell them the truth or he could be excommunicated from their church. He got, to, he got the perfect opportunity to state his lie publicly in the late 230s. A convert, a traveler named Julius Africanus, wrote to Origen. He was born in or near Jerusalem and spoke and read Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. He figured out that the Alexandrian Old Testament had stuff in it that wasn't in the Hebrew, so he wrote to Origen about it. Here's the funny thing. Africanus basically said everything that Origen already knew. But Origen wanted this letter to be made public to get the people off his back. So Origen basically reversed everything he said in the past and lied his head off. Origen said the ancient Jewish elders actually hid the truth and didn't get lots of stories into the Hebrew Bible. Origen said the Greek is the true Bible because God gave it to them even if it has lots of words and stories and sections that aren't in the Hebrew. Really. This is the same origin who said that God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and the Scripture intentionally put lies into the Bible so that only the more skillful and inquisitive could pick out the lies from the truth. You just can't trust this guy. He doesn't talk out of two sides of his mouth. He talks out of three at least. The bottom line is this. Origin's fifth column of the hexapla, with or without the asterisks and obelisks, got copied and spread around as the true Greek Old Testament and Apocrypha. I told you that Origin was popular. He was also trusted by the people. Origin was the origin. It's no different from a popular preacher endorsing the occultic Lambs of Bible or the Message Bible. People follow their leader like happy little sheeple. Let me sum up. People kept copying Origin's fifth column because they trusted Origin. But None of the Alexandrians had a consistent way to copy Scripture or to know what was Scripture. They had no set patterns. That is how the Alexandrian text got where it is today. You can't get three supposedly scholarly Alexandrian-type Bibles, Alexandrinus, Vaticanus, and Sinaiticus, to match. This is nothing like the Hebrew. Take a look at this. This is a photographic facsimile of a Hebrew codex dated about 1008 AD. It was kept in a synagogue in Leningrad. It is one of the earliest copies 
of the Masoretic text still in existence. Look at this. Isn't this beautiful? All these markings that you'll see around the text, here and here, right here, are meant to lock in the scripture with all sorts of notes. The scripture was carefully written. They counted lines, letters, spaces. Everything had to match up with the previous copy. That's why when you look at a few Dead Sea Scrolls that were copied fairly well, even though we have no idea where they came from, their provenance, or who copied from them, the chain of custody, they're almost letter for letter identical. This has a known province. provenance. We know where it came from. In 1008 AD, Samuel ben Jacob went to Cairo, Egypt, and copied the codex from manuscripts written by Aaron ben Moses ben Asher. This wasn't done by multiple people. Samuel ben Jacob actually wrote the consonants and the vowels and the Masoretic notes. That was unusual. The back of the codex has markings and notes of every smudge, scrape, mark, and bend in the text. It's amazing. Do you know why there's such a great difference between the Alexandrian Old Testament and the Hebrew? Because these guys believed they were handling God's words. They wouldn't even write the name of God until they'd washed and prayed. You won't find a Masoretic copy with a few chapters of 1 Chronicles, then in the same line jumping to the middle of Nehemiah like in Sinaiticus. No, they feared God. I don't think Origen feared God. I don't think the makers of Sinaiticus feared God. But the people who copied God's preserved words feared God. That's why I trust my King James Bible. And not only does it have a known history of coming from manuscripts by God-fearing people, it has also been over 400 years tried and tested and proved through the fire. The faith of millions has been enhanced by it. And by trusting it, they have served God faithfully and will receive their rewards in heaven. There is a fundamental difference between King James Bible-believing Christians and those who trust the modern versions. The King James people base their faith in the words of the King James Bible. Modern version people base their doubts on their Bibles. People like them intimidate you to doubt like they do. They want you to doubt the King James Bible and believe the doubters. People like me are giving you reasons to believe the King James Bible and doubt the doubters. After all I present to you, it really is up to you to make your choice. Faith or doubt, the choice is yours. God bless you and have a wonderful day.